We all have different ailments. We all have different propensities and proclivities and different issues. We know us and the better you are acquainted with yourself, the more you can accurately pray about yourself. But we oftentimes so busy looking at other people, we never take the time to do an introspective analysis of ourselves. To lose sight of the passion that's necessary to remain committed to God. There's so many things that come to distract us as we venture into the enterprise of being a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus Christ, not a pupil, a learner. And so we can't just stop at being converted. We can't just stop at being baptized. We, we have to continue the developmental process. The Lord has commissioned the church to make disciples and teach them to observe all things, amen, that he has taught us. So that's why we assemble. That's why we have Bible study. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have prayer band and prayer meeting. That's why we have ministries in the church, because it's not a one-size-fits-all process. That's why we have, even in Sunday school, we have different classes for different groups, because people, amen, we all learn differently. And we can, if we are in a group with people who are like-minded or, or might be similar, we can talk freely and share what's on our hearts and then glean from others. And so we have to understand when we do ministry, it's not about us. It's about him first. Amen. 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 It's about us also using our gifts, choirs, ushers. All of this stuff is what God has called the church to do. Amen. And so we don't just walk through this gauntlet of life and just, you know, just haphazardly and and give God half of our hearts. Our responsibility is to give him our whole heart. And as we open our hearts up to him, we continue to do the work of growth. The most important thing that a Christian can do is develop their spiritual formation. And that's through prayer and fasting and reading the word of God and also assembling. These are the things that are necessary for us to develop that spiritual formation. Formation denotes something that's going to keep us, amen, on the straight and the narrow path. Position us in compliance with God's will. Keep us calibrated concerning what God would have us to do. And we have to consistently work in those areas so that we can consistently stay in alignment with God. Because our flesh, amen, sometimes will compel us to make the wrong choices and do the wrong things. And as long as we're on this side, we need all of God that we can get. So the people who are committed understand that they need the Lord. The people who are dedicated know themselves. Amen. Again, this is a spiritual hospital. And they know what God has brought them out of. And they need God to keep them out of it. Amen. And so when we understand that, it produces a fire within us. Like Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit that will compel us to seek his face compel us to humble ourselves compel us to even be uncomfortable in certain seasons it's easier to lay down in the bed it's easier to keep all of your finances to yourself but i promise you there's going to come a time where god is going to produce something in your life or allow something in your life to happen so but when you have equity with god when you sow bountifully God will begin to supernaturally produce things in your life because you had the audacity to trust him. When people told you you're crazy, they're not going to help you. But God will come through. We have to have complete spiritual dedication. When we love him as we should, we will what keep his commandments. John 14 and 15 declares, if you love me, 
keep my commandments. And so if you're not trying to live up to the moral commandments, the moral law of God, which will be found in the Ten Commandments as we have discovered, if you're not doing that and you know you should, is your love for him on the level that it should be on? Do you really love him? Or do you just seek him because of what he can provide for you? Or what he can do for you or has done for you? But when you love him, you're not really looking for anything from him. You just love him. And you just want to obey him because what? You love him. And by virtue of you loving him, it will compel you to follow his commandments. Even when you don't say when it's preached, oh, that ain't, that, that ain't, that ain't about me. I can obey God over here. But you know what? I, God understands my heart. Like I said on Wednesday night, you know what? We use that excuse. God knows my heart. You know, he does know your heart. That's why he died for you. Amen. Your heart is desperately wicked. Amen. You cannot get caught up on what you feel in your heart because your heart will deceive you. Amen. And that's why we have to allow God to create in us a clean heart and renewing us a right spirit to take the stony heart out of our flesh and give us a heart of flesh where we can hide the word of God in our hearts that we might not sin against him. Because no matter how well you were raised, no matter what your environment was, no matter what your nature or your nurture is, it doesn't matter. We still can find ourselves deceived within the confines of our hearts. And when our hearts are wrong, our behavior will be wrong also. Our response will be wrong. Our dedication will be wrong. It will be steered in the wrong direction. So I have to make sure that my heart is right with God. And I can't accept him one time and not expect the enemy to fight against the reality of my conversion. To fight against the constructs and the constraints that I've gleaned from my time in the word, my time studying, my time assembling, my time praying, my time fasting, my experiential things that God has produced in my life. The enemy is going to fight to obscure that and stop that from landing on fertile ground. He does not want it to produce some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. So in order for me to remain steadfast, to remain unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, I have to know that my labor in the Lord is not in vain so I'm going to have a reward on the other side of this test but I need his help to pass this test and so because I need this test I need him to help me pass this test so he can bless me on the other side of this test and also bless me to be sustained or sustained within this test I need to admit that I need him have you ever said I got this I can handle this we all have said that at one point in time. When you say, I can handle this, I got this, now you erase the fact that you need the Lord to anoint you for this. Hmm. See, I need the anointing of God because the anointing is what makes me effective. The anointing is what gives, gives me power to run through troops and power to leap over walls. Power to endure things that people connected to me or around me are not able to endure because they don't have the power I have. They don't have the Lord on the inside of them where they can say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I need to love him and I need to also not only love him, but I need to live for him. Luke 9 and 23 declares, then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny who? Himself. Himself. And take up his cross daily and follow me. Taking up our cross daily is more than accepting Christ. We have to daily first deny who? Ourselves. See, we're so busy looking at folk that have been in the church all their lives and looking at them as the example. None of us are a perfect example. People are so, so sensitive when it comes to the church and they get mad because someone in the church didn't speak to them the right way or didn't look at them the right way. Well, people in the church are messed up too. But you're in the club with your drink and somebody step on your shoes, you're like, that's all right, dog, it's all good. But let somebody look at you funny in the church. 
we get hypersensitive when it comes to the church because we don't realize what the church really is. We all have different ailments. We all have different propensities and proclivities and different issues. We know us, and the better you are acquainted with yourself, the more you can accurately pray about yourself. But we oftentimes so busy looking at other people, we never take the time to do an introspective analysis of ourselves. It's easy for me to look at somebody else and ignore myself. But I got to deal with the consequences of the behavior of myself. So if I want to deny myself, I want to follow him, I need to ask him, Lord, help me to deal with this. Help me to deal with that. Help me to deny myself when myself, my flesh wants to step into that. Give me the power to deny myself. Yes, it's me, Lord. But if you keep denying you got a problem, how can you pray about the problem? Denial is produced when we look around and do inventory of our circle and blame it on other folk. Everybody got something, but no one got everything. So you have to be able to ask God to help you to deal with what you got. No one had a perfect upbringing. No one had a perfect situation. There's no one that can say, I haven't gone through some type of abuse. It might not be physical abuse, but I guarantee you, someone in here and everyone in here or watching on the stream or on television, you've had an issue with verbal abuse. Has anyone ever told you bad things about yourself? That's verbal abuse. But instead of internalizing it and personalizing it and allowing it to rest within the confines of your mind, your consciousness, you need to cast that thing out and say, you know what, that's what you say. But my God says something different about me. I have the resiliency to survive, to bounce back and also to even thrive in spite of this situation because I've taken the time to look at what the word has said about me and what God has revealed to me. Now you can say what you want to say. Now I'm fully persuaded and fully convinced that God loves me and God is taking care of me and because he loves me and he's taking care of me I'm going to deny myself I don't have to respond to your foolishness because my God is able yes and also we have to have denial living again Galatians 2 and 20 I have been crucified with Christ but nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives within me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and what gave himself, not I, but Christ. Note also Paul's words in Galatians 5 and 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so here it is. Here's the template of how you can deny yourself. Crucifixion denotes death. So just because the urge comes, just because the feeling comes, doesn't mean you have to accept it or walk in it. That's bondage. Now, because you've been born again, when Christ died, you died. When Christ rose, you rose. You've identified with his death, burial, and resurrection as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ. So in other words, you and your flesh, you and Satan got a divorce when you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. So now when Satan tempts you, you might think you just got to do it. No, you don't. Go take a cold shower or, or just listen to the Bible for five hours if you have to. Go ride down the road. People are not willing to put forth the necessary effort to deny themselves. You got to be determined. You have to be committed. Most people just say that's just how I am. That's a lie. That's not how you are. That's what you choose to be.
determined living. Daniel 1.8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel had to make a choice. No one could make that choice for him. This determination helped Daniel throughout his life. And because he made that choice in the infant stages, when the Israelites were taken over by a foreign nation, he made that choice because they were utilizing the best and the brightest from Israel to be in the king's court and to do certain things. But Daniel said, no, I'm not going to do it. Daniel was even willing to lose his life. And because he made that choice, we talk about the lion's den. But this was before the lion's den. Daniel made this choice before the lion's den. He sold to the spirit. So when you make that choice to do whatever you got to do to get away from temptation, to get away from urges, to get away from all these problems that confront you, when you put forth that effort, you are sowing to the spirit. You have a choice, flesh or spirit. Every day you have a choice. You purpose and make that choice. He provided seeds for God to produce a harvest. Later when he was in the lion's den, God produced that harvest. And they said the only way we can find something against Daniel is through his religion. They made a decree that no one could pray to anyone else but that false God. But, but guess what? He kept praying. With the windows open. He didn't go hide. <laughs> and just like the covenant said, we pray towards Jerusalem. You will hear our prayers and our petitions and you will come through. So he did not close the door and obscure his relationship. And guess what? Daniel knew the decree had been signed. He prayed openly, but don't people nowadays, they don't want people to know they're a Christian. Yeah, they want to just be like everybody else. They want to listen to the constructs and paradigms of the world because they don't want to face persecution. They don't want people to talk about them. They want to listen to what the world says about marriage. They want to listen to the, what the world says about gender identity. They want to listen to what the world says about all this stuff. When the Bible clearly defines it, it's very simple, very clear with what the Bible says. But the world is trying to obscure it. And the world is trying to take away from God's created order that he did in the beginning. So I'm going to face persecution when I decide to do what is right. But Daniel kept praying openly. And yes, they threw him into the lion's den. But because of what he did prior to the lion's den, that's why God shut the mouths of the lions. That's why he was able to come out. I'm still here. And if you didn't think it was supernatural, if you, didn't, if you thought that the lions just got sick for a little while and didn't want to eat, the same people <laughs> that came up with the plan, they threw them into the lion's den. And what happened? All of a sudden, they were as hungry as <laughs> somebody hadn't eaten in five days. All of them were eating. And so now we understand, let's study this. Purpose is to fix conclusively or authoritatively. Heart is the locus of a person's thoughts, mind, volition, emotions, and knowledge of right from wrong, your conscience. Understood as your heart. To defile means to make morally or ritually unpure. People are defiling themselves, defiling their families over and over and over again. Again, the law, the moral law, shed a light on what God saw as sin. Jesus Christ did not 
erased the law he fulfilled the law and he provided a way to be forgiven of some of those laws that were made very clear and underscored in the old testament so now i understand i can't just shack up i can't just just go and have sex out of wedlock and not ask god to forgive me of my sins and try to do what is right i can't steal i can't kill i can't do any of those things because those things are sin so now, in order for me to be able to walk away from that, I need to learn. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The word yoke means a stable or gear that joins two draft animals at the neck. So they can work together as a team. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 declares, be diligent and to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So now, as I come into this setting, I understand as we study the Ten Commandments, as we see what God has made very clear, as we see that God has brought it to the surface, the things that the world is saying, ain't nothing wrong with that. Yes, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It still is wrong. So if I love him, I will say, no, I'm not doing that because I love him. I'm not going to defile myself or defile my future. When Jesus was tempted, he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the only chance you have of doing what is right consistently, and even when you do your best, you're still going to make some mistakes, but you should be striving. You need to know what the word of God says, because the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. Also, complete physical dedication, the heart. Matthew 22 and 37 says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Again, the soul is the immaterial part of a person, which is the actuating cause of an individual life. The sight of all the psychological faculties such as the heart mind and the conscious so when we begin to grow in grace the holy spirit connects with our human spirit then the process of development ensues and our souls are being impressed because again your soul is the immaterial aspect of you where your volition lies your intellect your emotions so your soul can be impressed and be altered and changed. Amen. And that's why the Bible speaks of a soul being one. Amen. When you are born, your spirit is dead from your mother. When your spirit, you're born from your mother, your spirit is dead. When you are born again, now your spirit is quickened and made alive. And so now we have the stimulus, the impartation and revelation that we need to make better choices. And when you know better, you should what? Do better. For the eyes, the sin of lust, Genesis 3 and 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So if you look at it too long, it becomes too strong. Let that simmer. <laughs> you have to discipline your eye gates. Because if you look at the wrong thing too long, it will become too strong for you to overcome its draw. And so now you got to understand, I cannot fix my eyes on certain things especially the things I've struggled with I need to discipline myself to detach myself and turn my eyes if my eyes turn eventually my body will turn because I can't look one way and walk the other way because I hurt myself complete Material dedication. This means both our money and our possessions. Second 
Samuel 24 and 21 says, Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So we like to give God things that don't cost us nothing. Give God what's left over. God is looking for us to sacrifice our time, talent, and our treasure. Did he not pay it all for you? Did he not help you when you were dealing with your go through when the walls were caving in when it was dark and disjointed You didn't know how you were going to pay your bills. You don't know how you were going to get over You don't know how you were going to eat. You don't know how you were going to make it to the next day You ought to say Lord thank you because you did all of that for me the least I can do is sacrifice for you But we are so busy laying up treasures on earth when we should be consistently laying up treasures in heaven. The Bible says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor dust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so what I do is my heart is fully dedicated. My heart is fully committed. So now if my heart is fully dedicated, my heart is fully committed. Now my soul has been impressed and the Holy Spirit has made an impression on my soul through my human spirit. Now when I find myself having to make a good, a bad choice or a good choice, now I'm empowered to make the right choice even when the wrong choice is the easiest choice to make because I'm dedicated to obeying him because he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and if you want to follow me, you will deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me but seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you suppose a person went to their boss and said you know what I want to raise I want to raise but I know I haven't been given my best effort I know I haven't been doing my best, but I want to raise. I want you to give me that raise, and then when you give me that raise, then I will work harder. Not only will that person not get a raise, but they'll be looking for what? A job. But what we have to understand is that oftentimes we treat God the same way. It's easy for us to say, God, I'm going to give you some criteria. And then if you give me what I ask of you, now you've proven yourself enough to me. So now I'm going to dedicate myself to living for you. You got it backwards. I got to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So that means I got to deny myself. That means I need to do what is right. If you have been blessed by today's program, please visit us at MarcusFloydMinistries.com or call us toll free at 1-855-788-0299 to partner with this ministry as we influence the world for Christ. All gifts are tax-deductible to the full extent allowed by law.